So welcome everyone. My name is Charlene Margo and I'm co-founder of Nonprofit The Parent Venture. We are delighted to have with us tonight Lynn O'Shaughnessy, founder of The College Solution, who's going to be talking with you about winning strategies for finding the right school at the right price. Take it away, Lynn. Okay, let me get the my share screen here so I can get started. Okay. All right, let's move this around. Let's see. Okay, it's all ready to go. Okay. Looks great. All right. So, except it's not where it's okay. So this is the title page. So, anyway, thanks for being here tonight. I hope you. I plan to share a lot with you. So, um, and as Margot said, if you have some questions, we're gonna. I can. I can squeeze them in at the end. I'm always happy to answer people's questions. Okay. So, you're probably here today because you're worried about how much college is going to cost. You're worried possibly about blowing up your retirement nest egg. You're worried about taking on too much debt. You might be worried about making the wrong choices or you're worried about your kid getting rejected, right? All those are totally natural worries um, as you contemplate your kids leaping into the next phase of their life, right? Um, I actually started thinking about college when my daughter, Caitlin, who's, I'm up here in San Francisco visiting her, uh, when she was just a toddler. And ultimately, I knew she wasn't going to go to a top UC because she wasn't in the top 10% of her class at her private girls school in San Diego, which stressed me out because I really didn't know anything about college or choices at that time. So I was at the time a personal finance journalist and I was had been at the LA Times and I'd covered just about every financial topic imaginable except what I ended up calling late stage college planning. Like once you're done nearing the end of saving for college, how do you stretch your money out as far as possible? And I didn't know what her chances were. It was a super hard school, brutally hard. Um, her GPA was a little under 3.5. We didn't know what her test scores were yet. And, um, but she ended up, oh, I missed this. She ended up getting quite a few institutional scholarships from several schools. She attended a school called Juniata College in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. You probably haven't heard of it, but that's okay. There's a lot of schools out there, wonderful schools you haven't heard of. Um, she got a Spanish degree and a degree in entrepreneurship, and she started out in marketing and eventually became a marketing director at a toy company in San Diego. She ultimately launched her own company, uh, Maximal Space, which operated in major cities in California. She sold that, and she's now a senior director of volumetrics building companies, which is a global leader in modular construction. Uh, my son... Uh, got accepted to eight colleges, all the ones that he applied to. He got sizable scholarships from all of them. He was a, a math major, studio art minor at Beloit College in Wisconsin. Probably haven't heard of that either. Both of these are liberal arts colleges, which are, I happen to think, are wonderful schools for a lot of kids. He got a master's degree in education at University of Denver. He became a math teacher at a public high school in Denver. Then he left to be a Zen Buddhist for a while in Santa Fe and, and Vermont. And now he's a math tutor and an artist in New York. And I say all this because with my kids, it's been a success. They've done really well. They had a great um, experience in college. And then they ended up being able to move on to their careers. And nobody had any debt, including myself. And that's what I want to share with you guys, how you can do that too, okay? So as I mentioned earlier, late stage college planning, well, it's confounding, right? Like how do you make these choices? And that's when I decided to ditch my traditional personal finance journalism to focus on this instead. Um, so I started a blog and I've been interviewed a bunch of places. I did a, a book that's really old now, um, but it was a Amazon bestseller. Um, so that's me. So now I want to switch over and talk about how you can make really good decisions, right? And maybe hopefully lower your stress level about college. Um, first of all, I want to tell you that colleges are priced like airline tickets, okay? And this is how the college award pie is sliced. College, 48% of the money comes from colleges, 31% the federal government 11% state government, and then private scholarships are the smallest source of money, which I think a lot of people assume is the biggest, which it is not, okay? Um, big money often comes from the colleges themselves, okay? Oftentimes, whether, no matter 
what kind of income level you are happen to be in. Now, nationally, 62% is the average tuition discount at private colleges today. And 91% of freshmen who go to private colleges receive some kind of tuition discount, which might be shocking to you because you, the schools that always get all of the attention are the ones that don't discount as much, okay? Uh, don't give as many kids money, but it's there for the taking if you are know what, where to look, okay? So why are there so many discounts at so many schools? Well, except for the most popular schools, it's really a buyer's market. Most schools do not meet their freshman admission goals. This has been going on for many, many years. And so when you, when you need more freshmen in your classes, you have to give more kids a discount, okay? Now, having said that, the, the Cal States and the UCs are outliers in terms of where how money is awarded. The bulk of money in this state comes from the state Cal grant, which is strictly need-based aid. So state schools here in California give very, very few merit awards, okay? Um, here are the Cal Grant income ceilings. So if you um, want to look at this later on, all you have to do is, is Google Cal Grant income ceilings and you'll see who gets the Cal Grant, which covers, the Cal Grant covers tuition and fees for a student who qualifies. Okay, there's also a grade point average. It's not too hard to get to meet, but you can see from a family of four um, to get the Cal Grant to cover tuition and fees for a UC or a Cal State, um, you have to make uh, just a gross income under $131,200, okay? But there's also an asset ceiling, non-retirement money for the traditional student, you know, traditional family, you have to have no more than $101,500 uh, in the bank. We're not talking about home equity and we're not talking about retirement accounts. Okay, so if you don't qualify for a Cal Grant, okay, it's highly likely that you will pay full price for a state university in California, okay? And if that's the case, what you need to do if you are you know, wanting to save money is to compare the cost of a full, full price cost of a UC or a Cal State with what you would get from private colleges or public universities outside of California. Um, this is just an example I wanted to give of a friend of mine who um, uh, I helped out with college because she was a, a friend and it, um, my friend Lydia and her friend James. He was, when they were, when he was in high school, he, they assumed that the University of California would be the cheapest, but he didn't qualify for, he didn't qualify for a Cal grant. Okay. Um, so he, they were going to have to pay full price, but he did qualify for need-based financial aid at some expensive schools that meet 100% of need. And the more, it's the more exclusive, more highly selective schools that give, meet 100% of need. Of course, the issue is they don't take that many kids who actually have need, but that's another story I'll get to later. Um, he ended up attending Skidmore College in New York, uh, which is a highly selective liberal arts college. He got, um, at the time, and he graduated a few years ago, he got aid worth $204,000, which made it less expensive for him than a UC. He made lifelong friends, many of them from the East Coast. And he returned to San Diego after graduation, got a fabulous job as a software engineer at a major tech company, and he saved enough to make a large down payment on his house. Okay. So not only is it, I think it's smart, not even thinking about Jim, I mean, um, James, but other students and what's available. I think too many people in California just have tunnel vision in terms of what schools they should apply to. And then they freak out when they see what the acceptance rates are for them. So I really urge families to like throw a wider net. Okay. There's a lot of great schools out there. Um, and if you want motivation for why you should be throwing a, a wider net, um, this was just, as I said, I'm in San Francisco, I'm visiting my daughter, um, and this was in the San Francisco Chronicle um, just last week, okay? And it shows a chart that shows UC admission rates for every high school in California. So you can look up your high school, but just Google the name of this, 
and you'll be able, you know, be able to see in the Chronicle. I don't know if you need a subscription or not. I'm not sure. Um, but I looked up a couple of them, okay, that's in the Sequoia Union School District. And the first one was Sequoia High School. And you can see um, the acceptance rates for all of the UCs, right? I mean, the most popular ones, it's low, right? Um, not so much the ones that uh, aren't as popular, right? And then I compared that to uh, Woodside, okay? And you can see the acceptance rates are smaller at Woodside. And I think you'll find that um, trend at uh, probably across California that the schools that have higher income students, their acceptance rates to the UCs, um, particularly the ones kids wanna go to are gonna be lower, you know, because the state formula, uh, the UC formula really um, is tilts toward lower income students and lower income high schools or that have lower income kids. Obviously the schools in this district have a lot of affluent families, but probably in general, Woodside has more higher income students than Sequoia. That's what, I mean, I'm just, I think that's it. I could be wrong. Um, now looking beyond California, um, applications to the schools, there are over a thousand that are part of the Common App. Um, or use the common application or up 6% over last year, which was already a record. And it's a continuation of a dynamic that began in the spring of 2020, when of course the pandemic pretty much forced the vast majority of schools in this country to drop their SAT and ACT requirements. So that's of course encouraged uh, tons of kids to apply to schools that ordinarily they would never have a chance to get into. Okay, some of that is getting scaled back. Some elite schools now are saying, I, we need the SAT or ACT to uh, differentiate from kids, especially low-income kids. Um, but so, yeah, there are more kids that are, you know, applying, thinking it's kind of like a lottery. If you apply to enough elite schools, you're going to get into one of them, which really isn't um, true, but that's what a lot of people think. Now, while the number of applications have been going up, the yield, except for the very top schools, has been free falling. So it's not like all schools are getting more difficult to get into. That's not true at all. Um, now, to help you maybe reduce some of your stress level about this, um, I would um, keep in mind that what matters more than where you go to school is what you do wherever you go. And there was this, some studies that looked into this and I have I wrote a handout a couple of years ago on that kind of summarized some of the research on this very issue. And so I I think you're gonna put it in the, um, the chat, uh, the link to it, so you guys can have your own copy of this. I think it's about nine pages um, and it has research from I think the Pew, Pew Research and the Gallup and Stanford, but really, it really doesn't, especially high income kids, where they go is not nearly as important, okay, as for minority low income kids. If they can get into elite school, then that would be hugely beneficial to them. For high income students with parents who are highly educated, it's not going to move the needle, usually. Okay, so what also, what matters besides what you do in college in terms of your involvement, your internships, you know, have networking with people, knowing your professors to get recommendations for grad school or jobs, whatever. The other thing that's important is what your major is, okay? And you can geek out if you want and look at this study that uh, the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity has done on this topic, it's been, it was fascinating to look at. And what they looked at is not just um, where, you know, what the average, um, in, you know, salaries that new grads got who graduated from a particular school. What's vastly more important is what major you had. Because if you, if you look at this, and I'll show you some examples, the, um, the type of salary that you would get, not just beginning, but also lifetime, varies dramatically by school. 
I mean, varies within the majors of schools, okay? And they define return on investment of a college degree as the increase in the lifetime earnings a student can expect from that degree minus the direct and indirect cost of college. Um, median bachelor's degree is worth 306,000 for students who graduate on time, but the median conceals enormous variations because some fields like, not surprisingly, engineering, computer science, nursing, economics can produce ROIs of a million or more, while others like art, music, religion, psychology can have a zero or a negative uh, ROI. So I'm just giving you a couple of examples here. I pulled out one from Berkeley, or no, LA, uh, UCLA. And you can see some of the majors, like the first one, aerospace, the lifetime ROI is, you know, quite high. But then you can look at others like biochemistry, um, biology, there's a negative ROI. So that's super important. To, don't just think, oh, my kid gets into UCLA, they're set, they're going to make good... It, good salaries, no matter what they major in. Um, they might, but in general, these are the kinds of salaries that kids at this school in particular majors are making. And then I did one of San Diego State in my backyard where you can see, um, once again, the ROIs are very different for different majors. Okay, and they also, um, calculated returns for graduate degrees. Because I think a lot of students feel like, oh, I need to have a graduate degree because you know it's just something you need. Well, not if you want to get a graduate degree in certain majors, probably not a good idea, okay? Um, I can't get into it, but also graduate degree costs have skyrocketed because the federal government now allows you to borrow whatever it costs and schools aren't dummies, right? They're gonna charge as much as possible um, because they know that kids could borrow whatever it takes for whatever the, a master's degree is. But also you can see the ROI for uh, master's degrees are vastly different, right? Like if you get a film, video, photographic arts master's in NYU, the ROI is crushingly awful, right? But if you get one in engineering, um, it's, it's much, much, much better, okay? Okay, so one of the things uh, I wanted to share with you are free or inexpensive tools that you can use to widen your college search. You know, if you do what I think you should do is just look, don't just look, you know, at the schools that you're, you know, everybody else is looking at. Now, one great tool that I super like is College Aid Pro, which was actually created as a tool for financial advisors. I do an online course I've done for many years for uh, financial advisors on late stage college planning from all over the country. And this is the software that I recommend for them. But just recently, probably in the last couple of years, College Aid Pro has now also created a, um, a research or a tool for parents. And it's super, it's inexpensive. And I think it's 149 for the year. I mean, it's, it's a deal, I think. I would urge anybody who can swing it check this out. I mean, I get nothing for it, right? But I'm just saying this is the best tool. There's a lot of crummy tools out there. But one of the things if you do use it is you load into the software information about the parents, the kids, the parent income, the parent assets. And ultimately, um, you can type in any schools that you happen to be interested in. And you can see what the official cost of attendance is. And also for what your family, what, what the net cost would be, okay? And it's all based on what you provide the software, but then at the top, you can see this is uh, expected family contribution. This is what the software um, has determined. Uh, schools will think that you can pay for college. And I'm gonna talk about expected family contributions in a little bit later, but that's kind of what drives um, the uh, calculations for schools in terms of if someone qualifies for need-based aid. And this software also is totally meant for people who have no chance at all of ever getting need-based aid. They make a lot of money and what they're looking for are schools that will give them merit awards of which there are many, 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 okay? So not only does can you type in some schools 
and go, okay, what is our school? What is this school of my daughter or son went there? What's it gonna cost us? But also what's very cool is it also can, you can also use it to identify schools that you might not even know about that would provide your child with awards and that would lower the net price based on what you like to pay. So it's a totally cool software. I would urge you to check it out. And as I said, it's super cheap. Now, the other tool that I really like is called Tuition Fit. And it was started by somebody who was in the college world I really like, Mark Salisbury in Illinois, who started this website because his big thing is you schools are not transparent. Like you don't know when you're looking at a school if it's going to give you money or not, or you don't even know your child might have gotten an award from a school, but you don't know what other kids what awards they got in the same year, right? It's, it's just not transparent. So what I love about Tuition Fit is you can, a child who's a senior, for instance, can get access to real-time awards of the schools they're interested in. All they have to do is upload a award letter and, and they will, you know, eliminate all of the any kind of identifying marks including your name that sort of thing and then you have access to awards from schools that from students who have the same you know income asset level the same gp or similar gpa it's a great way to look for schools and then prior to senior year it's also you can get access to to schools um some of it if you pay a nominal amount before your senior year, you can get more information. But I think for the year, it's maybe like $50 or something. So it's totally worth it. But it's totally free if you want to wait till your senior year. And then all you need to do to get a free access is to upload one of your um, award letters, whether it's a merit award, a financial award, doesn't matter. Also, they have, um, they urge high school, high school counselors can have these accounts for free. So it's a, it's a great resource that I would urge everybody to check into because, you know, you could find out that uh, your child got an award from a school, but then you can see that somebody across the country got one that they got $5,000 more. So what can you do? You can say, hey, you know, I'd like some more. I'd like a better award. You gave this kid more. So why can't I get that? So it's a great way to also not only identify schools that weren't even on your radar, but also look at what other kids are getting from schools you did apply to, okay? Now I've been talking about expect family contribution. I'll explain a little bit more what that is. Um, it really will answer the question, will you qualify for financial aid? And as I said, it doesn't matter if you're, what's matter, I don't, I think people shouldn't get hung up on oh, I'm not going to get need-based aid. You know, it doesn't matter. What you want is a discount, right? You don't care if it's called a merit award or need-based aid. It doesn't matter. You just want to not pay full price, okay? So don't get too hung up. Don't get hung up on, will I qualify for need or not? Okay, so income alone, though, won't answer the question if you will qualify for financial aid, okay? To do that, you need to obtain your expected family contribution, EFC. Now, the FAFSA, which has been a mess this year, okay, total mess, they've, they've changed the formula. It's thrown them off. As you probably know, like kids are not getting to send in their FAFSAs. It's a mess. Uh, and then the FAFSA now calls it, just to make things a little more complicated, are now calling, uh, instead of calling it the EFC, which has been for many years, the expect family contribution, and they all call it student aid index, okay? So, but the CSS profile schools, those private schools that use this other financial aid application still calls it the EFC, right? But I'm just gonna call it EFC. It makes it a lot easier, okay? So an EFC is what parents would be expected to pay at a minimum for one year of their child's college costs. An EFC is expressed as a dollar figure, right? The higher the EFC, the more you'd be expected to pay for one year of college. Now, College Aid Pro, which I just mentioned to you, has an excellent EFC calculator, and but so does the College Board, and the College Board <clears throat> is free. So both of these calculators um, calculate the EFC based on the FAFSA formula and also the CSS profile. So you can use either one. 
<clears throat> if you're going to use College Aid Pro, I just use that one because it's built in and then you can start looking for schools. <clears throat> this is just what the college boards, you know, the homepage looks like. Now I'm gonna give you an example of EFCs, okay? So let's say a family has a adjusted gross income of 275,000. They have $600,000 in non-retirement assets. They have 900,000 in home equity. <clears throat> this is what their EFC recently would have been, right? There's two formulas. There's the one linked to the FAFSA, the federal one, and the one institutional that's linked to the CSS profile. So you can see these are high EFCs. So what does that mean? It means if you have an EFC this high, you're not getting need-based aid at any school, right? It's not happening, which is okay because then you're gonna look for schools that give merit aid, right? Um, but you can see here's the cost of the private school. The family's EFC is 83,000. It exceeds that price of the school. So demonstrated financial need, big fat zero, okay? Now <clears throat> let's look at upper middle class, Example, 185,000 adjusted gross income, 170,000 non-retirement assets. And I mentioned non-retirement because retirement assets don't count in the financial aid formulas, just non-retirement. <clears throat> and then they have some home equity. Their EFC is lower. Um, now, in some cases, you could, <clears throat> some families could qualify for some need-based aid. If their cost of the college is 80 and the EFC is 51, there would be that much financial need left. Some schools would just give you um, a merit aid that would cover maybe some of it or maybe all of it or need-based aid or some combination or some schools might give you nothing. Like that's a the thing. There are schools that are very generous with aid and there's schools that are really bad with financial aid. Okay, so... Um, and then the what, final example is low to middle class example, 59,000 adjusted gross income, not much non-retirement money, and they don't own a home. Their ESC is really low, right? They need a lot of help. Okay. So what are some strategies? Well, when searching for, if you're wealthy, higher, upper middle class, when searching for schools, students should primarily be looking for private and state colleges that provide healthy merit scholarships. If if you don't want if you don't want to pay full price, okay. Um, a strategy for upper middle class would be to possible to obtain need based aid for a family of private schools that provide excellent financial aid. That would be schools nearly all elite and highly selective that meet one hundred percent of financial need or close to it. Except many of these schools, these are profile schools, assess home equity, okay. Um, and if you are looking at schools like that, well, one way, to, well, I'll get into it later, how you can, how you can determine if um, they are going to assess home equity. It's, you can just use the school's net price calculator, but I'll get into that a little bit. Um, okay, so for low to middle class kids, students should make sure they apply to their own state schools. Preferably four-year schools in the state because most, especially lower income kids who go to community colleges in the state, they never end up at the four-year schools. It's a terrible, it's a terrible stain on higher ed in the state of California. So if they can swing it, it's better to start at four-year schools, um, UCs or Cal States and go full-time and get that Pell Grant, I mean, and get that Cal Grant, and typically you're gonna get the federal Pell Grant too. That's that's the way to go, much better than starting at the two-year school, typically, okay? Um, also a strategy, of course, except for this year, you should complete the FAFSA and aff aff applicable, the CSS profile as early as October 1st, the student senior year in high school. And of course, this year that was blown apart. Kids couldn't, the the that FAFSA wasn't even really widely available until late January, and there's still problems, especially for students who are undocumented. It's still a mess. It's terrible. Okay. Um, also, for a strategy for lower to middle class kids, looking at, uh, they should absolutely look to qualify for that Cal Grant, the federal Pell Grant, and it's possible you can get additional need-based aid at state universities here. Okay, depending on how low your income is. And then 
kids who are low income that are high achieving should also explore, you know, elite and highly selective schools that have excellent need-based aid. Um, they could also look for merit scholarships out of state public universities, but they need to know that non-residents do not get need-based aid at state schools outside of California. Okay. Now, outside of California, state universities represent a huge source of merit scholarships for students. Okay. Um, Non-residents, I said, should aim for merit scholarships if you're looking at state schools outside of California, because as I said, you're not going to get need-based aid. I mean, like a school like, you know, University of Michigan or Oregon State, they're not going to give a kid from California need-based aid money. They're giving it to their own kids, okay? Um, reasons why merit aid has soared at state schools, well, U.S. News rankings, it's kind of craven, but state universities still want to get up, inch up in the rankings, so they want kids, high achieving kids, um, because that'll impress U.S. News. Um, also, states use outsiders to help with budgets because non-residents, even if they get a price break, are still going to pay more than residents. Now, the UCs used to be notorious for doing that. They've scaled it back. They've had to scale it back um, because of the state government is saying you got to scale it back. Um, and they had some deal with the, with the state and the um, Sacramento, I mean, Sacramento and the UCs. And then also universities have to fight off competing poachers like in a case of um, in my university that I that I uh, graduated from, University of Missouri, there were other schools, University of Minnesota, University of Alabama, Arkansas, different schools that were trying to get smart Missouri kids to go to their schools or giving better awards than University of Missouri was giving. So they had to increase their state awards to kids. And then they started poaching kids at universe in Illinois, attracting them. And then Illinois had to increase their scholarships. It's just kind of a, that's just how it goes. Um, and then in some sc state schools, recruiting can be fierce. You know, you, you once again, people only focus on the school's that everybody's focused on, like Oregon or Washington or Boulder, you know, or um, Michigan, right? But uh, most schools don't get that kind of attention. And so they have to try harder to attract kids, okay? So for instance, University of Maine gives students, including uh, California kids, uh, a huge discount to come to their school so that you won't pay any more than you would at a UC. Um, but you can see that schools that are more in demand, state schools are going to charge more because these schools are not dummies, right? They know kids want to go. If you have a big enough brand, you can charge more money. As you can see here, like Berkeley, Virginia, Michigan have a crazy prices for out-of-state students, which maybe makes everybody here feel better because you don't even want these out-of-state kids. You want more slots for California kids. Um, and we talk a little bit about private colleges um, and awards. 3.4 million kids attend private colleges, like my two children. Um, one thing you have to be aware of is that universities on the East and West Coast tend to have the highest net prices, which is not too surprising because if you ask kids where they want to go to school, they want to go to schools in, in cities on the coast, typically. And so this is all supply and demand. If you have a lot of students, especially rich students wanting to go to your school, you don't have to uh, have as big a discounts or any discount. Okay, now if you look at, uh, these are federal figures, you look at the schools among the top 5% most expensive schools net price. That means after discounts, most of them are on the East and West Coast, no surprise including some from around here, right? Like Santa Clara, for instance. Um, okay. Um, now, nearly all private colleges give merit scholarships. Um, and keep in mind, like I mentioned earlier, that affluent families will, in some cases, qualify for need-based aid at expensive private colleges. The more expensive the institution, the more likely families would qualify for some need-based aid. But as I said before, if you, if you make too much money, and there's a lot of people living in the Silicon Valley that make a lot too much money and have their 
have homes that have a lot of equity in it, well, then you're just going to look for schools that give merit awards, of which the vast majority do. Okay, so the most elite universities offer the best need-based aid, okay? Schools like these, the Ivies, they are going to be terrible for high-income families in terms of finances because you're going to have to pay full price for those schools because they don't give merit money at all. Why? Because they have tons of rich kids who go to these schools. They don't have to give them anything. Like Stanford could charge a million dollars a year for tuition and they'd still be turning away kids, right? It's all, as I said, supply and demand. Um, so yeah, the bargains will not be at the most elite. You look at the top U.S. news universities, national universities, the top ones are not going to give merit aid. They don't have to. Okay. Um, uh, so these elite research universities are the ones least likely to give discounts. They, because they have so many rich students clamoring to get into their schools, they can give need-based aid, but most are a large percentage of kids that go to their schools um, pay full price, right? Now, schools belong below the elite research universities are far more likely to provide discounts. Master's level schools, which are kind of a hybrid between research universities where the, the emphasis is on professor research, TAs, teach or graduate students teach a lot of undergrads, right? At a school like Berkeley or Stanford or the Ivies. Um, re, uh, master's level can be more of a hybrid between the research universities where undergrads are kind of the third wheel after professor research and graduate education and liberal arts colleges where there's just undergrads. That's who is taught. Like there's no graduate students or there's not as much professor research. You know, you're not going to find Nobel Prize winning professors at a liberal arts college, but you'll get small classes and teacher professors actually teach undergrads. So let's give some examples, okay, of just how little these elite research universities are giving out money. Uh, Tufts, for instance, only 38% of students at that university get money from the school, okay? Boston College is a little better, right? These schools, um, as I said, don't have to give out as many discounts. They don't have to because they can charge rich students full price and these students will come because of the brand name, okay? Now, let's compare that with some liberal arts colleges, including my son's. My son went to Beloit College. 98% of students at that school get something. Like the, everybody gets something most of the time if you go to the vast majority of liberal arts colleges. Why? Because while kids can grow up dreaming about going to Harvard, they're not growing up dreaming of going to Beloit College in Southern Wisconsin, right? Or Grinnell College in Iowa, right? or Goucher College in Maryland. So they have to try harder. They have to give everybody some kind of a discount. Now, those schools down here, um, I put the, through a couple of those in, Colorado College in Colorado Springs and Claremont McKenna in, um, in um, Southern California, um, one of the handful of Claremont schools, they're highly rated and they have primarily, they're so highly rated in US News, they get, a lot of rich students going to those schools. So they don't, they dial back the money. They don't have to give these kids money because they're going to get them. Okay. And then just some examples of master's level schools. Um, not as many kids are, you know, think they want to go to these schools. Um, so they have to give out more money. That said, like Loyola Marymount, I was just looking that up uh, the other day. And I'm like, wow, 100%. But they're smaller awards. So they're, they don't do give good need-based aid. Their merit scholarships are pretty puny. So if you have a school that costs 75, 80,000 and you get 8,000, it's still a lot of money. So I'm not saying that these schools are going to be screaming deals, but they, you aren't going to pay full price for them. Now, once again, I threw one of them in a master's level school, Villanova, that um, only half the kids get money there. Why? Because it's a popular school. It's in Philadelphia, and they have a really good basketball team most years, right? They're in the 
March Madness competing usually. And so that just attracts kids. So because they have um, so many students applying, they can dial back the merit awards. Okay, so another thing I think you can do while you're evaluating the price of schools is to use net price calculators, okay? Um, this is just, you, you would use, to use a calculator for a school, each school has their own calculator. Uh, you need, if it's a good calculator, you're gonna need some of the same financial information that you would use for uh, expect a family contribution calculator, right? And they're gonna provide a personal estimate of what one year of college will cost, right? Basically, they'll take, they'll take all your information and then they'll determine, uh, will the federal government give this kid money? Will the state government give this kid money? Will we give this kid money? Will we give them institutional money, merit or need-based and subtract that and that's your net price, okay? Um, I've already mentioned that. Uh, and you can play with this, like for instance, you got a lot, you're sitting on a lot of home equity and otherwise you might qualify for maybe potentially need-based state. Well, run the calculator. And these are gonna be profile schools that are gonna care about home equity. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So use the calculator and run it with your home equity and then take it out and run it and see if there's any difference, okay? And also I would say you should be doing this before your child falls in love with schools, or before you go on an expensive uh, college tour trip on the East Coast, right? Like you wanna know what schools are gonna cost. Don't get your kids' hopes up, right? Um, and run the calculators. And if the net prices are bad, uh, I'd say don't let your child apply or just say, look, if this is really what we're gonna have to pay, we're gonna have to pay 90,000 for a school you're not going. So just keep that in mind. So that could help reduce some of the emotional, um, the, the tears, the drama when a child can't go to the school they want. And they start trying to guilt the parents like, why did I try so hard in school if I can't go to my dream school? Well, because that's what you should be doing, right? You should be trying your hardest. And that doesn't mean you can go to a $90,000 school. <clears throat> and actually, there's a school now that's almost at 100,000. Vanderbilt could be the first one that used to, people used to think that University of Chicago was going to be the first one to uh, break six figures, but it's probably going to be, it could be Vanderbilt. I mean, it's crazy, the prices. Um, now, while I think using net price calculators are really good, um, some of them are really lousy. Like half of the calculators in this country are really bad because they use the federal template that just ask a handful of questions. They don't ask about assets. They don't calculate merit awards. They don't even ask about your specific income. They're, it's a joke, but they're free. So half the colleges use them. And, but most of the private colleges that you'd be looking at do use good calculators. As I mentioned, every school has to offer a net price calculates by federal law. Um, the easiest way is to just Google the name of the school and net price calculator because schools really don't like these calculators and can have them buried in their websites. And it's super critical to use um, net price calculators if you're applying early decision because that you're supposed to be, it's supposed to lock you in, right? If you apply early decision, you're gonna have a better chance of getting in, but then you're, you could, you know, be told, yeah, your kid gets in, congratulations. You got into Amherst and it's gonna cost us, it cost you 85,000 85, a year, right? Uh, not that it's not binding, but you're supposed to promise that you will go if you get in early. So use the net price calculator before that, before you let your child apply. Uh, and then you can always appeal. You shouldn't assume that the first offer is the last offer from private schools. More families, I think, should consider appealing not only need-based, but also merit awards. Um, one way to do it is to play one school off of another. So if you have a better award from one school and your kid wants to go to a different institution, just contact them and say, hey, you know, money is an issue. My child really wants to go to the school, but can you provide um, a better award, right? Um, yeah. And also I'd say, don't worry if your request is after the official deposit deadline. Of course, this year it's out the window because of the, the feds 
totally messing up the FAFSA, which is messing up the admission season for schools all over the country. Um, so some schools have um, pushed their um, deposit deadline to June 1st. But even when that is in a crazy year like this, you can um, you can often, especially schools that you know really need more students, they're going to be totally flexible. Um, and you know, plenty of schools are going to sweeten their offers because the competition at is fierce. Um, and also, just because a student has put a deposit down doesn't mean that a family can't ask a school for more money. Okay. Plenty of schools want an opportunity to beat competing offers from other schools. And in fact, schools, a lot of private schools, not the ones that are deluged with applicants and turn, you know, 95% of applicants away, but all the other ones, the vast majority of schools, like there are schools, they'll keep recruiting into the summer. Okay. Or they'll call you up after you, you might not even have applied, but they were in the system. They'll call and say, Hey, you know, We'd love for your child to apply. You know, we've got scholarship money, that sort of thing. So as I said, deposit deadlines, I really wouldn't worry about it for a lot of schools. And this year, of course, <clears throat> is totally different. Um, so, you know, I would say don't stress so much about getting into colleges. Your kids are going to get into colleges. You know, what matters really is what they do when they get there. Um, and also like what you're willing to pay. And so I would urge you to use those tools that I've mentioned to you. Um, Tuition Fit, which is a great resource. Um, and as I said, high school counselors can use it too. Parents can use it. Um, and seniors, if you, if before senior year, you can I think use it for probably $50 for a whole year. And if a senior who has a award letter um, can get it for free and see exactly what other kids are, what awards are getting for this year. Okay, it's awesome. Also, I check out College Aid Pro. I think it's a wonderful resource, cheap resource to not only determine your EFC and what schools that your kid is interested in, what it would cost, but also provide a lot of other schools that would cost whatever you say you're interested in paying, right? So anyway, that, and also please read the handout that I, you know, I wrote it a couple of years ago. It's still good about does where you go to college matter? The answer really is no, it's what you do wherever you go. Also, I think there was another, which I haven't, mentioned, but there was a re it's a, a new research study that came out a couple weeks ago that looked at um, salaries, what kids are making, and what they determined is what's really important is when you get out of school, one, that you've had internships, super important, and two, that when you when you get out of school, you get a job first thing that is a, a typical um, job that requires a college education, okay? A college, a bachelor's degree. Um, because when they were looking at students, the kids who started out without a traditional job that required a college degree, like they started out being a barista or you know some other lower paying job that doesn't that doesn't require a college degree many of those kids never caught up and never ended up getting uh jobs that were you know were in the same level as students who got a decent job uh right out of college so that's something to think about is you know what that first job is is as it turns out really important Okay, and that's all I have for everybody. I'd be happy to answer some questions. Let's see if, I guess I could just scroll down and- uh, Lynn, I'll help you. Okay, all right. Well, thank you, Lynn. That was, <clears throat> that was incredible. Everybody, of course, wants the resources and the recording and everything else. And we promise we will get you these things. We're gonna send the video out. Everybody who registered will receive the video. And Bev has put in the chat, 
a link to her handout. So you'll see Lynn handout. And oh, good. Look at all those great comments. Okay, Lynn, if you want to stop I'm sharing trying, your screen. Would yeah. they be in the, I don't know, the webinar chat or the, or the, I actually did Q&A. Uh, in the chat, you see there under Bev Hartman, it says yeah. Lynn handout. She put it in again recently. Okay. Okay, but everyone um, will get these links as well as the video when we send out. Okay, so right. somebody's saying, would you compare going to a community college after high school to finish basic courses and later join uh, UC? Uh, no, I would, I as I said in the my presentation, I would, I think low-income kids should absolutely start at um a four-year school, state school, like the UCs and the Cal States have, you can get the Cal grant, which is going to cover all your tuition, okay, and fees. And then you can get a Pell grant, which can help cover um, books or helps cover room and board. And some low-income kids can also get more of their, you know, room and board covered. So yeah, I think because it's so difficult it's really difficult. They don't have those good pathways uniformly in the state for kids who are going from a two year to a four year and they can get lost in the shuffle and they oftentimes just go part time and they just end up never getting a bachelor's degree. So I would I would urge low income kids, they, they can get in, they get to a four year state school here. Um, I think that's your best deal. All right, so next question, Lynn, this is a good one. Now that Prop 209, the one of the limited affirmative action was overturned, should a black student list their race even though we know that some have bias? Uh, I don't know about the bias. I think that, um, I think this was all way overblown. I mean, for one thing, California has not had affirmative action for many, many years That's in true. higher ed. It's been that way forever, or not ever, but a long time. And what what the uh, state of California does is by um, they they uh, give weight to students who are low income. They don't really care what your race is. And most, uh, you know, there's a lot of, I guess probably there's a lot of students who are low income in the state who are black or Hispanic or some other. Um, uh, um, person of color, right? So I don't think it has any um, implications at all. And as you can see, if you go through that that San Francisco Chronicle art article, and if you look at the at the schools that are having a better luck um, getting into UCs, for instance, it's the it's the kid it's the schools that have a a, a larger percentage of students who are um, lower income, you know, which oftentimes means they have more students of color in there. So yeah, I don't, I think really the vast majority of schools in this country, it's, it's fairly easy to get into schools. It doesn't matter what your nationality is, what your race, what your ethnicity is. I think what this was, um, so I don't think it was a big deal because even in the most elite schools, like the um, Ivy League schools, their affirmative action, a, a huge percentage of students who got in to these schools, including Harvard, were rich black students, okay, or rich international black students. So um, I really, I think that this is way overblown in terms of um, what affirmative action, you know, the Supreme Court rulings was going to do. That's my take on it. Okay, fair enough. There's a really good description of that. Folks, if you're interested in Paul Tuff's recent book, so Lynn, we know during the pandemic, a lot of schools, as you said, put a hold on accepting SAT and ACT scores, but now they're back. And again, there was an article in the San Francisco Chronicle this morning about there's not enough test sites, there's not enough seats. So what are we gonna do this spring for all the kids desperate to take one of those tests who aren't finding a spot to go take one? Well, I don't, you know, I think it's all gonna get shaken out, right? Like it's gonna, it will eventually, you know, right now, yeah, they probably don't have enough test sites, but I think this is going to be a temporary thing, you know, but, you know, I don't know what, I mean, because I think most schools still are not going to use tests, are not going to use test scores, 
you know, the vast majority of schools, some of the more elite schools, because they felt like it was hurting really talented minority students is yeah. why they say they are going back to test scores because a lot of the minority kids who had high test scores, they felt that they probably weren't high enough to submit, even though they were. So when you, especially today, when there's so many, um, um, there's so many, uh, kids who have A averages, right? The grade GPA is inflated. How can you tell the difference between A students, right? Um, and so, so these schools, some of these schools are saying, well, we need the test scores back. So we know, um, you know, who really is exceptional. But as I said, the vast majority of schools are never going back to it. And I doubt the UCs or Cal States, they're not going back to that, right? Okay, thank you, Lynn. So <clears throat> there's a question here about, um, author says, can you talk a little bit more about the types of merit aid that are available? Is it by major? No, it's not by major. It typically, though, you know, sometimes you can get, you can look at a school and say, oh, there can be scholarships by major, but typically it's, it's just the school gives um, freshmen um, merit aid. And like I said, the schools that are, are the most elite, like I gave you that list, like I showed you all the national, the universities that give very little, all those schools on there give very little merit aid or if any at all. And I see someone who was mentioned at Amherst, that's the same issue. It's a very elite school, elite liberal arts college. They're not giving merit aid. Neither is Williams, neither is um, Middlebury. Like those schools, if you look at the schools that are liberal arts colleges and national universities, the schools at the very top of US news and rankings do not give merit aid because they have so many rich students who go to their schools who will pay full price no matter what it is. Okay. But you know, probably, you know, more than 95% of schools in this country give merit scholarships. Okay, good to know. So here's another good question. How do schools count income from disability insurance for a parent who is completely and permanently disabled? Do you know that, Lynn? Well, I don't know off the top of my head, but if someone is, is you know, disabled, then, you know, they're not going to have a high income typically, right? I mean, you could ask a school that question, you know, but, you know, I would say that they're probably going to qualify for an e-based aid. A lot of schools, if they, I know, I think it's, I can't remember what it is. It's, it's, you know, if disability insurance uh, payments are considered or not, but you could ask the financial aid office at any college and ask them that question. Yeah, that would be a good question to ask directly. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So Lynn, you've asked, I mean, you've spoken about this in the past, uh, Parent asks, is there a reliable resource to find out the student outcome, internships, first job, first salary for a college of interest? Uh, well, I was talking, you can look at the um, the uh, freeop.org, you know, that, that study. You can go and look on that um, because you, people are going to get this recording, right? Or you can, they can go back. Well, just, just. Google free f r e e o p p dot org right, and I would just Google thirty thousand college degrees, and you will find what they've said about this. And you can find within embedded in the article is a little search engine, and you can type in the name of any school, and you can get a list of what the ROI is for individual majors within any school. Okay, fair enough. So this writer asks, what's considered low income? With inflation and everything rising prices, what's now considered the middle class? I'm noticing a big difference between income in the Midwest versus West Coast. So how do the schools differentiate? Well, I don't think they really do. Um, you just, it's what your expected family contribution is, right? And you compare it to the cost of the school. Um, with the FAFSA, they give a little break to people in certain zip codes, like out here in, you know, the Bay Area, you get a little break, but you're not going to get that much of a break. Um, so, you know, if, if your income is too high and the schools you're interested in have 
take into consideration home equity, then you're going to look for schools that give merit aid, right? And you're not going to look at schools that only give money, like these elite schools that only give money to students who have financial need. And really, kids who have high income are have a better chance of getting into highly selective schools. They, de they definitely have a uh, admission advantage at, at private schools, not, at, not in the state schools here in California. Kids who are from lower income kids who have an advantage, more of an advantage to get into state schools here. But that's unusual. You know, kids who are looking to go to state schools outside of California or private schools, you have some, if you have more money, you're more likely to get admitted. Okay. Here's a question, Lynn, that came in the chat. It's a good one. What percent of merit scholarship applications need separate essays? For those essays, what should the content focus on? Most schools don't require any kind of essays for a scholarship. Like if it's a profile school, you're going to have, or, you know, a school that, that uses the common application, then you're going to have to um, um, write essays anyway, right? But it's not for specific merit scholarship. Typically, you know, you apply to a school and then they tell you, oh, you get this amount of money. And really, it's really kind of a misnomer to call it merit scholarships. It's just, schools just call it tuition discount um, internally. But for families, they call them merit scholarships. It's just tuition discounts. They're trying to figure out and they have sophisticated software to decide to determine what will it take for this kid to come to our school? That's all. It's not really about merit at all. Especially when you consider at some schools, everybody gets a, a tuition discount. How could that be merit, right? When everybody gets it. Okay, fair enough. So Lynn, this is a question that I think lots of people wonder about. Is the college price tag only for tuition? Or does that cost include room and board, books, et cetera? Right. No, it's a, you know, the cost of attendance, official cost of attendance is tuition and fees, room and board, books, transportation, miscellaneous. Now schools will, you know, some schools will put, you know, a lot in miscellaneous, like a UC has a lot of money for any miscellaneous. Other schools won't put hardly anything. But yeah, that's what you want to look at. And, and because the cost of attendance can be, very different for different schools. I would just really to compare apples to apples, I would just look at room and board and tuition and fees and compare all the schools that way. Okay, fair enough. Um, does College Aid Pro provide the college list that provides merit okay. scholarship? College Aid Pro, which I love, right? For, and it's like, as I said, about, I think it's $149. It's a steal. What you do is you are going to type in all your information, your assets, your income, the kids' academic profile, you know, GPA, if they've taken the test scores and all, all of this stuff, right? And it will determine, you know, what your EFC is. And then if you have a list of schools, it will say, okay, here's the cost of attendance, but here, based on what you've told us, is what this school is going to cost. And beyond that, then you can say, okay, well, tell me, show me other schools based on my EFC that would give me money and make, keep my price at say 40,000 or 30,000 or whatever, right? So it will generate other schools that are tailored for you. There's not just a list of merit scholarship schools because that would include almost every school in the country. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. All right, uh, Lynn, here's a good question. Would you mind commenting again on how to appeal a financial aid package? And is this approach different for UC, CSU, out of state and private? Well, I think it's mostly gonna be, as I mentioned in the uh, presentation, private schools. Yeah. Like UCs, Cal State, they have a formula. And you know, do you qualify for the Cal grant or not, right? It's a state program. Right. They don't have wiggle room about giving you a state uh, Cal grant if you don't qualify through the state um, requirements. Right. So but so it's mostly private schools and. You can, um, as I said, you can, you know, if you have an award, you can always appeal to them and say, hey, I got a better award from another school. Right. And could you 
match that and let tell me how I can what what the what the procedure is to go through it for an appeal, right? Or you can also, you've got your EFC, right? And you can say, well, this was my EFC and this is how much you gave me. You know, is there any wiggle room? And frankly, sometimes uh, schools will give more money um, and it can be really based on how their freshman deposits are coming along. You know, if they're not getting as many freshman deposits, they could go, let's throw this, this kid some more money because we need to, you know, reel kids in. Okay, that makes sense. So again, this related question, somebody's asking about strategies for negotiating bigger tuition discounts. I think that you've addressed that, Lynn. Do you have another comment? Uh, no, I think that's probably, yeah. Okay, that's all right. right. And so here is, here's a good question. What happens after freshman year? That is, if you have a merit age packet, merit aid packet, what happens after that first year? Do the schools change what they're well, giving? Well, no, what you should ask schools is, um, well, what does it take to keep that merit scholarship? Okay. I had a friend who's a, a doctor actually at UCSD whose kid went to, was in engineering and went to Montana State. They have a good engineering program there and also uh, research for undergrad, which is really, really unusual for research universities. Anyway, he went there, but he was very bright and he was going to get the top scholarship at Montana State. And they he ended up in talking with his mom, deciding not to get that one and take the one, the next one down because it would require a 3.5 GPA. And he was an engineering and he didn't know, you know, if he could hold on to that scholarship. Uh, he didn't want to take the risk. But a lot of merit scholarships don't have that high of a GPA, right? They can be 3, 3.0 or 3.25, but you should definitely check to see what it takes. And Lynn, just because we've heard you say this before, but I want you to say it again. We tend to think, especially here in California, that the only schools that kids want to go to are on the coast. Mm -hmm. the college is in the middle of this country, yes? Yeah, there's tons of schools, wonderful schools. And really, there's not that much difference between if you're going to go to a state university, you know, especially a research university, there's not that much difference. I think what what is, you know, because they're all kind of set up the same way. Research universities, I said, they're really focused on professor research. They bring in professors because they've done really well in their research. They don't usually care if they can teach or not. Um and, you know, it's mostly the grad students that are going to be teaching the undergrads, right? A professor, a renowned professor might teach from a lecture, you know, from the lecture hall, but that's it. Um, so there's not that much difference between research universities, I would suggest. Um, but what can be more of a difference is the majors, right? So you could have a school that has a really good, like a physics department, and a really terrible theater arts department, right? So to me, what's important is to look at, spend some time at whatever, whatever major your kid is interested in and, and do some research about that particular department um, at schools, you know? I think that's, that's important. Like, do they, you know, what kind of class, do you ever get to know your professors, right? If it's a research university, like, because will you ever get any recommendation? You know, can you learn, know a professor well enough to get a recommendation? I mean, you certainly can at a liberal arts college, right? Because professors are teaching 20 kids, right? But at a research university, professors could be teaching 500 kids. Like I give an example, I have a friend who's a in the STEM, I'm not going to say which one, but he's a, a tenured professor at uh, UCSD, and um, kids come up to him all the time, going, "I'm, you know, applying to uh, medical school, and I need uh, some STEM professors recommending me." And my friend goes, "Well, I don't know who you are. You know, you were, yeah, there were 200 kids in the class. I would, I don't know who you are." And they're like, "Well, could you spend some time? You know, can I get bring take you to have a coffee and?" I can tell you about myself and he'll go, no. So, I wow. mean, you want, a, you want professors who are going to 
put a little effort into this, right? But so anyway, there's a lot, I think, to it, of, of research that should go into majors, right? Not only looking at what kind of money can you get if you pick a certain major, but okay, when you're in a major at a specific school, what kind of attention are you going to get? What kind of, you know, are you going to be able to thrive at a particular school? And I can tell you that some kids can do fine at a research university. Like my daughter, she could have gone to Berkeley, no problem, right? Because she's very assertive, very, you know, out there, super uber networker, no problems. My son is more introverted and he would have just shriveled up at a UC, right? But he went to a liberal arts college he majored in math, which is really hard. And I think he probably wouldn't have been able to do it at EUC because you probably have a couple exams a year, right? I mean, a semester. What if you don't do well in one? Whereas where he went, you had uh, participation points, you had quizzes, you had exams. But, you know, and I, he would tell me sometimes that he would walk, he walked out of his one of his math classes and the professor who was the chairman of the department came up to him and goes, well, Lynn, or, uh, Ben, it seemed like you, were, you weren't exactly, you weren't understanding what I was saying. And Ben goes, yeah, I was having a hard time. He goes, well, come into my office. Let's talk about it. Like that would never happen at a UC, <laughs> never. You know, with a professor, probably not. So well, anyway, I think that's important is to look at different kinds of schools, the small schools, the big schools, the medium, you know, the hybrid, the master's level schools and see what will fit for your kid and your budget, right? All right, thank you. One last quick question, Lynn, because this writer has asked twice, so let's let's help out. Uh, says, you suggested checking out different scenarios with calculators like equity. How can we change our equity level should the calculator suggest it? Well, you can't change your, your equity level. Like whatever your house is worth, that's what it's worth. It's just that the calculator will, what I was suggesting is, with net price calculators, this is for profile schools, uh, the private pro CSS profile schools that a lot of them care about home equity. Now, of course, state schools outside of California don't care because you're not getting need-based aid. It's only merit aid, right? So the net price calculator, it's just if you, you could always call a school, a CSS profile school, there's 200 of them, and call and say, do you, do you consider home equity? And then you'll know. Sometimes they'll be a little wily about it and not really tell you, or they'll say, well, it depends. Then you can use their net price calculator and type in your equity and see what the net price would be. And then take it out and see, is it the same price um, or not, right? So some, it's just so that you know if they're using home equity or not. Okay, that's all. Now, if you have a lot of home equity, well, then you're not getting probably need-based aid. And you're just looking for merit aid. Who cares if it's not need-based aid? It's just, you don't want to pay full price. Most people don't. Okay. And thank you everybody who's weighing in on the chat. Lots of good information there too. All right, Lynn, we have come to the end of our time together. You have given us all an incredible amount of information to chew on. Thank you. Thank you as always. And everybody, I want to reassure you that you will be getting this video, all of you who registered, along with some of these important links that we've shared today and Lynn's handout. So again, thank you. Look at all these hands. Thank you. Everybody. Yeah, thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Isn't it great? Look Good luck. That. Good luck. <laughs> Look at that. Good luck to everybody. Take care. And we hope to see you again soon. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.